interesting. We are welcoming the Queensboro president today, uh, Donovan Richards Jr., who is a lifelong resident of Queens. And not only does he represent uh, the borough where your proud principal lives, um, he also has an amazing Dr. Kirkland. Yes, uh, though he is born in Brooklyn, I'm sure he'll give you that in his intro. Uh, but he does uh, currently reside in Queens. Uh, he is here to share his story with you, which I had the pleasure of meeting him recently and thought you have to share this with our fantastic boys. And so I'm going to give you a little secret, uh, BP Richards, that is, this is the founding class of the boys prep. That means that some of these gentlemen started with us when we opened our school in 2014 in the first grade, and they are now in seventh grade. And so high school is just on the horizon for them as well as the rest of their amazing lives. And so I think this is a pivotal moment for you to share who you were at that time. And they have some questions for you as well. Um, I'm the CEO of Public Prep. As I've previously mentioned, we run the largest nonprofit charter schools for all boys and all school, all girls in the city. And our boys' school, the Boys Prep, is located on 151st Street in Grand Concourse. And so I'm really excited that you can be with us this morning um, and show a little love to the Bronx um, and to our boys. Dr. Kirkland, do you want to just give your opening remarks and then I'll. Yeah, uh, Mr. Richards, let me just uh, tell you, number one, we're honored, but number two, let me just tell you, get ready for how we do it uh, here at um, the Boys Prep. So they already know that I'm gonna do this. So good morning, Boys Prep. Good morning, Boys Prep. Good morning, Boys Prep. Okay, Mr. Richards, that's how we, that's how we greet each other uh, first thing in the morning here. Um, I am uh, the proud principal, colleague Kirkland. Um, like uh, the amazing CEO, Ms. Uh, Bradshaw said, I'll give you our third floor elevator speech. So Boys Prep is now in its seventh year of existence. We have around 746 scholars, grades K through seven. Uh, we recently just got our charter renewed um, for five years. We like to brag about that because most charters are only renewed for one max three years. Um, we are in a brand new building on the corner of 151st and Grand Concourse. And if we did not have COVID, we'd have you up in here in our brand new theater. Um, we are part of a bigger network of schools called the Public Prep Network that consists of five other all girls schools. Two of those schools are on the Lower East Side, three of them are in the Bronx. One of those three is actually incubating in our building, um, but we have more than enough room for them. Um, and we're just excited about our scholars who are now preparing to go to um, high school uh, this time next year. They have already taken the ELA as well as the math state exam. We think that they did absolutely amazing. As a matter of fact, every scholar that's on this call actually took the exam. And we feel really good about um, where they are uh, headed. Um, like Ms. Bradshaw said, I am a proud Queens resident. Uh, I'm in a Queens Village, 218-32-110th Avenue. Um, so you are my borough president. Uh, and I'm very happy about that. Um, also see that you're in the, you've um, backed uh, who I'm backing for uh, mayor. Um, so I'm happy to hear about that. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had you on today. No, that was just a joke. That was just a joke. Okay, good. So uh, without further ado, we really, uh, they, they don't want to hear from me. They really want to hear from you today. So um, take it away. Oh, thank you so much. And I want to thank uh, Janelle and, and I, Mr. Kirkland. Thank you. And I see Crystal's on. And I had the privilege of being on with them a few weeks ago discussing the future of education in our city. And um, let me start by saying uh, I was not born in Brooklyn. I'm a Queens, Queens kid. No Brooklyn over here. We don't, we don't do that in Queens. We don't even do the Bronx, but we like the Bronx better than Brooklyn. No offense. <laughs> All my friends are from the Bronx. <laughs> I actually, quick story, used to do some mentoring out there in college. I actually, right off the Grand Concourse, probably somewhere in your neighborhood, a, a few of us would randomly get on a van um, from Nyack and come down into the Bronx and mentor young people who probably were around your age and bring them up to the college campus for the weekend so they could actually get the experience of a college campus and what college life looks like. 
And that was important because we needed, you know, a lot of us, you know, especially coming from where I come from and where you come from, could not even envision ourselves being in college. So I was very happy. I've not kept up with my two young men, my, you know, who I used to mentor, but they both went through college. And, you know, these were at risk youth, you know, coming from the Bronx, just like many of you. And that's the segue into my story, just briefly. I, you know, I was born to teenage parents. Um, really, every odd stacked against me possible, like many of you. Um, you know, my, my parents, you know, labored and, and pushed us as hard to stay out of the system. Um, you know, we moved from place to place. I probably lived in every place <laughs> in Queens, pretty much. I People will say, where did you grow up in Queens? And I'm like, I lived everywhere. But, you know, we finally, my parents finally settled in Hollis when I went into college and obtained home ownership. My father um, just became a citizen two years ago. So if you come from a family of immigrants, I am no different than you. Um, and, you know, sort of my journey is not the, 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 the story you hear normally when, when, you, when you think of politicians and, and politics. Um, I almost filled out of high school and that really actually started in junior high school. I was probably in the seventh grade, um, came coming into the seventh grade. I was pretty okay. I was in one of the fairly good classes but then as I, as I got comfortable in middle school, you know, the peer pressures of the neighborhood took over. And, you know, that's when my uh, grades started to drop. And then lo and behold, by eighth grade, <laughs> I was like in what you would consider the troubled class, the class nobody, the dangerous minds class, where, you know, if you ever saw that movie. <laughs> um, I'll never forget the class number, 810, <laughs> uh, which was considered one of the more trouble classes. Then I get accepted into Jamaica High School and whoa, did the peer pressure really take on? So um, come on. So I, I'm coming into the ninth grade and like many of you, you know, the peer pressures of the neighborhood really picked up. You know, there were gangs, there were, you know, there was drug activity around me. Um, I had friends who carried guns. And, um, you know, there was an incident, and, I, and I'll speak about this because this is very important for you to hear, going into the 10th grade, well, in the 10th grade, you know, I'm walking with a, a few of my friends and one happens to have a gun and he shoots somebody right in front of me. And, um, and that experience there was really a, a game and life changer for me because what I realized is when those, when those bullets flew, every kid ran their own way. You know, this is at a very busy intersection in Queens, you know, what we consider a crossroads when you're getting on the bus, Jamaica, Jamaica station. And, and unfortunately, that young man went on to do some time. Um, fortunately, the young man that he shot, who I also knew, lived to tell the tale, but, you know, has a scar on his face. He was shot in the face and in the back and lived. So I say that to, to say, you know, watch the company you keep because there's that decision right there, just me walking with my friend, like I could have been charged possibly, right? Even though I had nothing to do with him, what he did, um, but I could have been an accomplice to that, to that shooting and been charged. And although I sit in Borough Hall, you know, right across the street from my, from my office is, the, is the, the courthouse where, you know, if you're on Rikers, that's that's where you're going to for them to hear your your case, the Queens District Attorney's Office. So I count my blessings in saying that you know I dodged uh, you know jail um, because that that could have been a real situation. So watch the company you absolutely keep. And then in eleventh grade, like this light bulb went off. Um, so I ended up at a basketball prep school up in Albany, New York. I was <laughs> my parents shipped me out of the city. And they really didn't have the money to do it, but we didn't. We weren't fortunate enough, you know, at that time to have smaller class sizes. Um, I did have a guidance counselor at Jamaica who really tried Jamaica High School, who really tried her best um, to motivate me. Um, but the peer pressure was real. I I had about a 52 average, you know, in the 10th grade. So the 11th grade, I'm shipped up to Albany to this basketball prep school. Many of you know Lamar Odom. There were a few basketball stars who came out of that school. So I instantly you know, went up there for behavior and grades, but um, instantly became like an A student. You know, That's when I made the decision that 
I wanted to make it in life. I was going to do something different with my life uh, and subsequently stayed up there for two years. I had to do four years of work in two years. I didn't even come home in the summer. Um, and I tell the story because I'm never ashamed of my story. I think it's important that individuals like me tell my story. So I, I went on to graduate uh, on time. <laughs> um, a lot of work. I, I instantly became a, a, a peer. You know, I would um, motivate because a lot of my peers looked like me, you know, in the school. And, you know, we all would get together and do study groups all of a sudden. Um, and although I was a cool kid, I was a cool kid you know, I still studied. And, and that really enabled a, a lot of other young men who look like me, who very similar to the school you're in, it really enabled us all to gain a, a confidence that we didn't have, that we could make it. Um, so I went on to become after that because my parents did not graduate high school. Um, so I was the first to go on to college in my family. Um, uh, study in communications. Uh, I was looking at radio and television very early on. Um, and then life hit me. <laughs> you know, my parents tried to do everything to keep me in school at that time, but unfortunately it became pricey. Um, so uh, by my sophomore year in college, I had to come home. I had to drop out, unfortunately. You know, the college kept me an extra semester because they really loved me. The deans and everybody you know, felt I was doing everything I, I could and, and giving it my best shot. But, you know, life is real. So I had to come home. But right before I came home, I had a very close friend who we took sort of different paths. I talked about high school, ninth and 10th grade. I had a very close friend who uh, unfortunately was shot and killed. Um, he was 19, 19 at the time. Um, so I'm coming home from school technically, got to go to his funeral. Um, you know, he was no different than me. We both were athletes. Um, you know, his life, he sort of had taken a different path, unfortunately, and, you know, ended up doing some time on Rikers Island and, uh, but came home and was really trying to get his life together. He was working. And unfortunately, because of, um, all of the information he knew at that time, I remember I told you, you know, talked about being careful about the company you keep because, you know, there are people who want to see you fail. Um, and and they, may con they may consider themselves your friend, but they're really not your friends if they're not pushing you in a positive direction. So unfortunately, you know, somebody he knew called him outside to, to have a conversation. And um, as he closes the gate, that person shoots him in the back of the head uh, and in the back. His little sister finds him uh, in the grass. And I mean, it was one of the, you know, one of those defining moments in my life, but it was, it was the toughest thing to see guys, like the toughest guys on my block are like at the funeral crying, right? You know, and, you know, one thing walking away from that funeral, when I looked at him in the casket, one of the things I walked away with is saying, I want to do something about gun violence. I had no idea what it would be, had no idea it would be politics, but, you know, I met my local council member at the time at a gun violence meeting and, you know, decided, you know, I would volunteer a few days a week with him. I wasn't getting paid for it. Um, I never thought I would end up working for him. But in November of 2003, uh, he calls and he gives me a job opportunity. And I'm like, whoa, wow, like what, what? These politicians, I'm not, I'm not into politics. Who, who the heck are these politicians? They don't understand our stories. And, um, so, you know, I, I go in and mind you, when I went in for my job interview, I'm like in Timberlands and jeans, like, like, like I had, believe it or not, I have no hair now, but I had, I, I remember like just getting my hair braided at that time and then like cutting my braids off for the interview, I at least knew to do that. Um, <laughs> so, um, so he hired me on the spot. Uh, I started the equivalent of a man with a broom and a dustpan. Um, um, working my way up to become his chief of staff um, from everything from scheduling to legislation to the budget to, you know, how do you fill your potholes, all of those things I learned over the course of my 10 years there. I went back to school, um, got a degree in aviation management because I actually never thought I would be in politics, but discovered like, hey, the JFK airport is like right here. Why can't I go into aviation? I could like run the airport or something. Um, so I was the first to achieve getting a degree in my family, uh, very proud moment for my parents. 
Um, you know, a lot of my cousins never made it to college, um, you know, and uh, then I run for office in 2013. And I'm about, I uh, think I'm, I'm, sw I'm about 29 when I become a city council member, um, became the chairman, the first black African-American to chair the Environmental Protection Committee. So for those of you who are interested in climate change, you know, I shaped a lot of the city's policies. Then I um, went on to become the chairman of the Zoning and Franchises Committee. So I oversaw the mayor's housing policy plans um, and pretty much any development happening around the city. And then I became the chairman of the Public Safety Committee, which enabled me to have um, uh, oversight over the New York City Police Department. Um, when I was about your age, 13, 14, um, my first experience with the police department was getting stopped and frisked. Um, and unfortunately, I'm walking up the block with my cousin, and they say we fit the description of two guys who robbed a store. And me knowing no better, any better, you know, they say, do you have anything in your pockets? And, you know, it's a cold November, put my hands in my pockets, and, you know, four detectives pulled their guns on us. And, you know, fortunately, I was, I lived to tell that story. Um, but you know, having oversight over the police department enabled me to bring that experience to the table, um, but to also work with the department as well, because I will always say not every police officer is a bad officer, but we know that in certain communities that over-policing is rampant and you're from the Bronx, so I don't have to tell you about that. You know the stories, you've heard the stories. Um, so fast forward, um, the, the, the prior Queensborough president went on to become the district attorney. <laughs> uh, and then I run for Queensborough president. And, you know, it was a very competitive race. Um, and I won the race and was sworn in last December and uh, have hit the ground running. Um, you know, and I see Monica's on the line. We're about to announce a lot of great budget initiatives, but I oversee about a $70 million budget this year in capital funding. Um, you know, I shape policy and influence um, housing policy across the borough. Um, I oversee 700 community boards this year. We worked hard to make sure that we diversified our community boards. Um, you know, and I'm the cheerleader for the borough. You know, people say, what, what does the borough president do? I'm both the cheerleader and defender of the borough. So if there are policies and things I don't like that the mayor is doing, you know, my job is to stand up and to speak up you know, for, for the community, for, for Queens. And, and it's an honor to serve and represent 2.4 million people in the most diverse place in the world. Um, and um, and it's, it's an honor to be here this morning. So I know that there are questions and I don't wanna um, belabor you with, with everything, but, but, you know, it's been, like I said, an honor to, to be here, to be the first black man elected as Queensborough president, to be the youngest in history, um, and to carry the torch of representation um, from communities like yours. Um, so I hope that I serve as some sort of motivator for some of you who are on the crossroads and trying to figure out life. Um, what I would say to you if I had to give you any advice, you know, follow your heart, follow your dreams. Uh, it's nothing wrong with chasing money, but don't let that be your number one um, goal in life. You know, think about doing something meaningful as well. Um, and, you know, if you're interested in a field, you know, you should start now. You don't have to wait till you're in high school. You don't have to wait till you get to college. You, you should look at internships and look at opportunities that, you know, will get you to where you want to be in life. So thank you for having me this morning. That is my story, brief synopsis, so much more. But, you know, just wanted to give that to you and say congratulations. I know it's been a tough year for you and your families. Some of you might have lost folks to COVID. Um, mo some of you may be dealing with food insecurity, um, you know, the pressures of housing. Um, some of you might live in a one bedroom apartment like me when I was growing up with like, you know, five siblings trying to figure out virtual learning. <laughs> I didn't have virtual learning back then, but it was still tough being in that like studio apartment with like five of us um, trying to figure out life. Um, so I would say to you, keep going. When it seems hard, you know, know that you have a support system at your school and don't be afraid to ask people for help. All right. So that that's my story. So thank you for having me this morning.
AP Richards, that was amazing. Um, and I know that there are some questions before we open it up to questions I wanna share with you. There's two things that are special about our schools. One, our classrooms are named after namesakes. And so we're not known as room 810 or uh, even Mr. K's classroom. We're known after amazing, incredible individuals who've made a difference. And your story is reminding me of so many of the trailblazers at Boys Prep like Wes Moore, like uh, Martin Luther King, like Jackie Robinson. I'm sure this story will resonate with our, our boys and we just appreciate that so much. It is also May and so every May we have a week of college and career week. So all of the advice that you're giving is right on time uh, for some of the conversations that our boys are going to be engaging in and have since they were in the first grade. So thank you so much for that. But Dr. K, I'm sure the boys are ready to get hyped and ready to make us proud. Yeah, Ms. Bradshaw, they're ready. Um, like Ms. Bradshaw said, um, Mr. Richards, I have a 19-year-old uh, son now, and sometimes I tell him it's good when he hears it from someone else. Mm. So you have resonated everything that I've said to these amazing scholars on a daily basis. Um, Janelle is 100% right. She had us reading The Other West Moore. So your story sounds just like that. As a matter of fact, just so that you know, our scholars are now reading Dear Martin. Um, and it's talking about some of those same themes. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, we have uh, maybe uh, six to seven uh, scholars who are gonna ask some questions. They're gonna introduce themselves uh, first. They know how to do that. Uh, without further ado, we're gonna start with uh, Chance. Chance Solomon, are you there, Chance? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, good, good, good. Take it away, Chance. All right. So my name is Chance Solomon. I'm in the class Tristan Walker. I started in voice prep in 2020. I transferred from another school. And my favorite subject is science because I like how the way our teacher teaches us during like um, different subjects. She talks about the way how, the, how it makes sense. And my favorite aspect of an all voice school is how we all feel like a community and how we all like protect each other and stuff. And my future plans are to become a Navy SEAL and a businessman. Nice. And the question I have for you is that boys prep, our core values are brotherhood, scholarship, responsibility, merit. What would you say are your core values and how have they shaped your path? Uh, my core values are, um, so I, you know, one of the things I pride myself in is, um, I, I, I want to say the word conviction is, is, is something that, um, is it's it, it's sort of in politics it's you know you, you sort of could be at a seat or 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 um you know a lot of decisions are made based off of what is my political calculate what could be a political calculation will i make friends here will i make enemies here what you know but i've always prided myself in just as real as i'm talking to you today um conviction is a very important word for me um, because I come from, like, like I said to you, a, a neighborhood like you. Um, so I, ha, keeping those core values that shaped me coming up, you know, from, from the experiences I had from middle school up until now are, are would sort of drive my, my decision making here. I would say um, some other words, humility, you know, you should, you should always strive to, to be humble. Um, you know, it's easy to sort of sit in this and you, you're not getting a good depiction of what this office looks like. But, you know, I, I remember in the city council, like my, my office was probably like the size of the bathroom in my office here, which is, <laughs> right? And people will come in and they'll be like, where's the rest of your office? And now I got like this whole big building that covers like a two or three block radius. Like, it, it, you know, and it's um, so humility you know, never being afraid to ask people for help or assistance and not being afraid to say you don't know. I would also say priding myself in um, learning. I talked about when I was in the city council, becoming the chairman of the zoning committee. And, and you said science is your favorite subject. <laughs> that was definitely not mine. Um, but zoning is like one of those tedious, you know, positions where you have to learn about um, you know, commercial overlays and R1s and R2s and, you know, um, uh, you know, the, the size of buildings and, you know, the FAR 
you know, and I'm like, what, what is all this? But, you know, one of the things I did is when I, when I got that position, especially being a young black man, I knew that you better know what you're talking about when you go sit in a room with, you know, individuals who built the World Trade Center, you know, people who all of these big, you know, developers down to small developers who may own, you know, a place you perhaps live in, right? Um, so being able to have those real conversations um, because I educated myself, I was not afraid to learn. And it was, I won't tell you what helped me get through those tough nights, you know, learning the zoning handbook for the city of New York. Um, <laughs> but what I will say is sitting and just burning that midnight light, you know, candle, applying myself is, is really something that's gotten me here. So I would say for any of you, no matter what subject you're, you know, or what, what career path you take, you have to apply yourself. Um, application is important. Know what you're talking about. Be a master of your craft. You know, that's, that's so those would be some of the things I think, um, you know, humility, conviction, knowledge, um, and real world application. Um, you know, because, you know, we could say, you know, we want the sky to be blue, but the question becomes, how do you ensure the sky is blue? You know, you really want to dig in and apply yourself. Um, and also, I would say, always have a plan A and a plan B. And I like that you spoke of two different paths, a businessman, a Navy SEAL, and maybe you can apply, you could do both. That's not a problem. Unfortunately, they don't allow me to have two jobs. <laughs> um, but it doesn't stop me from, you know, if I want to write something or, you know, I love music still. I, you know, I, I, I actually, I forgot to mention this. I interned at Violator Management, which was um, before I got into politics for a summer. I thought I was going to go down to wanting to manage, you know, music, music uh, artists at one point in my life. Um, just last week I had, or a few weeks ago, it was full circle because, I had a, call, a conference call with like LL Cool J's manager, you know, last week working on some things in Queens. I worked with 50 Cent, I worked with Busta Rhymes. I, like all of these people that you know, you know, I came through looking at internships because I thought I, I wanted to get into that field until life took me in a different path. But that plan A, B, C, you know, I would say keep that um, and, and apply yourself in whatever you're gonna look to do in the future. Hope I answered your question. You did, Mr. Richards. Number one, you told us that you're a uh, '90s baby with uh, '90s hip hop. You just named like the top five '90s hip hop. Uh, also, we believe in this thing called positive public praise. So let me just tell you, Chance Solomon was one of our scholars um, who was late almost on a regular basis. Uh, he has two younger siblings. Um, I had a let's call it a um, a young man to man conversation uh, about with Chance, and Chance has been uh, to school every day since then. At around five minutes to seven, so mm. he's he's already got he's already got that. So I think I I, I think he deserves that shout out. Next, uh, Carlos Pena. Carlos, are you there, Carlos? Carlos is absent. Carlos is absent. Okay, good. Uh, that's not good, but we'll we'll check on that. Uh, where's my man, uh, Jonathan Mello? Jonathan Mello. Jonathan Mello. Yeah, I'm here. Good, good, good. Take it away, Jonathan. Uh, good morning. My name is Jonathan Mello. I'm in Christian Walker, aka TW. I started at Voice Prep in late 2019. My favorite subject is math. My favorite aspect of an old boy school is that we can all relate to each other growing up, going through boyhood into manhood. My future plans is to one day get into Stuyvesant or get into Harvard so I can have a future in business. And my question for you is what advice would you give to a young man who wants to pursue leadership or career in politics? Um, well, well, congratulations on that. And, and, and I'm, I'm married and my wife actually ended up at a program in Harvard. So, and I, I, I actually just drove her <laughs> to that program. I'm like, wow, I've never, Harvard's campus is very nice, by the way. <laughs> and we just had a baby. I'll never forget the, the night we were, or the weekend we were up there. Um, uh, Trump was sworn in. Like, the, like Trump won that night. And, and I remember my son being like, like five months years old. And he just would stare at the TV and he's like, 
who is this? And, all right, anyway, I can't get that political, but that, but I just, I, I'll never forget that. So the point I'm making is um, one, you know, you're already on to the right path. You know where you want to go. You know where you want to be. Um, and math is your favorite subject. So between you and chance, y'all, y'all gonna go further than anything I ever will go further in. <laughs> um, um, so for for uh, the 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 answer to answer your question, if you are interested in public service, um, in politics, you know there are volunteer opportunities. Um, you know you have elected officials in the Bronx. Um, I don't know who represents the Grand Concourse, but I'm assuming you have. I think it's like Vanessa Gibson, maybe uh, Councilwoman Vanessa it Gibson. Is. If my memory That's serves correct. me correct, see, look at that. You're correct. Uh, correct. Note of that, right? And she is like one of those individuals who, who she's running for Bronxville president as well. That's not a plug, by the way. But but she is like one of those people who is who's very serious about engaging young people. Um, so I would say, for me, I was this 18 year old kid, and you know, I volunteered a few times. And, you know, I would say that that is definitely a pathway into politics. Um, you know, I, I've taken I've taken a lot of young people into my office. So I've had young people who came through, for instance, summer youth, the summer youth program. And they're like working at Borough Hall. They're like in charge of departments here. Um, um, pretty much, you know, when I when I became a council member, starting from the city council, I was very serious about making sure, ensuring that younger people were engaged in the political process. So I was the oldest person in the office. And I was like, you know, like I, I mentioned, 29. By the time I left there, I was probably about 36 years old before I became the borough president, 30, 37, um, and pretty much the oldest person. So I always reach back. So I would look to leaders who reach back. And you have some of those. You have your Bronx borough president currently, you know, Ruben Diaz Jr., who's been such a great cheerleader for the Bronx, I mean, he is someone that takes young people under his wing. And a lot of those young people have gone on to become, you know, elected officials or either they, they serve as chief of staffs. Um, so I would say that that's one opportunity. And I, I wouldn't limit it just to politics. There are many ways to get engaged in your community. You can join a democratic club. You can join a nonprofit organization. You know, you could volunteer at these places. Politics is not the only answer to solving the ills. We need people, for instance, one of the things a lot of food pantries complain about um, is they don't have enough volunteers. Young people are just not volunteering anymore. And we need you to, I know we're on Facebook and TikTok and, am I right? Yeah, TikTok, I gotta get TikTok. Um, <laughs> Instagram, but there are really opportunities out there and I would urge you all to take advantage of those volunteer opportunities. One, it helps to build your resume. So if you're looking, I think you mentioned you want to, one of you mentioned you want to get into Stuyvesant, you know, you want to be able to stack your resume with those volunteer opportunities as well. So even as you look to go into college, you want me to write your recommendation letter as well, right? If you're going to Harvard, right? You know, you want to have a full complement. Everything is not about a test. You know, you want to make sure that you're engaged in, in some public service as well. And when you make it big in life, you should do that still. You know, all of you are going to go on to be successful and to make money, but that doesn't mean that you'll be happy making a whole lot of money. Ask people who make a whole, whole lot of money if they're happy. I mean, a lot of unhappy millionaires in my lifetime. Uh, <laughs> um, so what I would say is reach back and make sure you never forget the Bronx, the places you, you've grown up in. Give back to those places as well when you go on to be, do bigger and better things as you get through life. So volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. Internship, 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 internship. Those would be the keys. Uh, so and, and, and that may even mean unpaid, all right? Because a lot of, uh, you know, the new generation believes you should just wake up in the morning and become a millionaire. It doesn't work that way. You don't become the borough president by sleeping. You gotta, you know, you have to be engaged, learn, and you have to find those volunteer opportunities. No doubt, 100% agree. Um, two things, number one, Vanessa Gibson is a friend of Boys Prep. Uh, we, so we've definitely had her up at the school. Number two, um, I believe most of our seventh graders are of the age where they are eligible for the summer youth uh, program. Mm -hmm. So they have we have already given out those applications uh, right. to those scholars that are eligible. Uh, speaking about eligible, uh, Alexander Johnson. So Alex is uh, happens to be one of our scholars who is remote. Um, he's been here since day one. Alexander, you ready? 
Yes. Okay, take it away. Okay, so as Dr. Kirkland said, my name is Alexander Johnson, and I've been here since the first grade. I've been here since the first grade. I when it comes when it comes to my favorite subject, I teach it harder. But right now, I'm really into I'm really into history. Okay. And if I had to choose my um choose like the best aspect of an all boys school, I'd say that our mindsets are usually somewhat on the same accord, uh, somewhat on the same accord, and uh, somewhat on the same accord when it comes to like life and how things are going through and how like you're going through these times right now. And, and my question for you, and my question for you is that at Boys Club, we have like this growth mindset to always keep moving through, even through the hardships of life. Um, um, was there ever a, mo a moment when you had to persevere um, persevere through your life? Oh, yeah. Um, I would say one of the, mo I mean, there were so many different times. I, talk, I, I talked about my story of making it through high school. Um, it's very tough. <laughs> um, you know, but but achieving that was 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 monumental you know, on so many levels. To, and I'm the oldest in my family, so setting that example for um, my siblings was very important. It, it enabled all of us went through high school. I talked about coming from teenage parents and how complicated that that was. You know, our life experience of coming up. Um, so I would I would start there, um, but I would say, um, you know becoming an elected official was not easy you know I had to do so much um you know to become a city council member because no, no matter how well prepared I was for that moment there were still forces out there that didn't want to see me achieve becoming a city council member um and then you know sometimes you go in life questioning well am I good enough you know could I do this um I would say the hustle and bustle of trying to make it through school and at the same time working was probably, woo, and not having a car. <laughs> so I would have to travel to meetings at night after school by the E train to the 84, 85, 80. And um, now looking back in hindsight, I say, whoa, how did I make it through that? You know, to have to try, work all day, go to school at night. Then if I got out of school, let's say 7, 7.30, you know, um, having to then go to a meeting, having to squeeze in studying, you know, I mean, I, I look back at that in awe. And, and part of that is, you know, motivation. And, and that's why, you know, schools like where you're at. And I, my um the school I went to in Albany was also I mean it was it was girls and boys but but you could you know the girls were somewhere else the boys were all together <laughs> you know we couldn't mix they they really let it happen um so you know we were able to focus a little bit more <laughs> you know as boys um you know and 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 I and I would say that learning how to focus was something so important throughout um, my my travels and in, in getting here. So I, I would say that that was probably one of the toughest times. And then when I ran for office, you know, they were like, "You got to raise seventy thousand dollars," and I'm like, "Everybody in my family broke. Where the heck am I? How am I raising seventy thousand dollars? How how am I doing this?" And I there would be times I'm like. I remember somebody sat me down. They were like, you know, you're gonna have to raise money to be competitive. You could, you know, you have everything else. Um, you know, how are you gonna get support here or there or there? And I would have to meet with people and I would tell them my story of how I got here and the work I did in the community. And, you know, um, you know, it, it was tough. You, you running for office will humble you very fast because you will find out who's your friend. You'll find, out who, you'll find out who's not your friend. You'll find out who your pretend friends are. And that probably, you know, coming into office in 20, 2013 was probably the most humbling experience because there was certainly disappointments along the journey. Um, but, you know, we hung in there. We, we you know, we, we put the blinders on and we stayed focused on why we were running, which was to serve the community and we we came out victorious i won my election by 60 votes the first election 60 votes it was one of the closest elections that the city council has ever seen probably in the last decade um 
but the the point is is we pulled it out <laughs> and i'm the borough president now i mean how how could you beat that <laughs> that's what's up so, that's what's up yeah what's up. Uh, um uh mr richards in an effort to try to make this a two-way conversation um you've heard a little bit from the boys what question if any do you have will allow you to ask us a question what question do you have for one of our scholars okay um I guess the, I, I always like to hear, you know, if there if there was something that we as leaders um, could focus on right now, if, if you had the opportunity to tell me or the mayor or someone or the governor or whomever, your local Bronx, your Bronx world president, your council member, what would one thing um, be that you would want us to focus on? What are we lacking in right now? Where could we do better? Um, that would be my question for you. Um, I, I got a student who tells me almost every day uh, what I could be doing better uh, as principal. So uh, Ansel, Ansel Gutierrez. <laughs> Ansel, did you hear the question, Ansel? My name is Ansel Gutierrez. And I am in the class um, E in a role, also known as IR. He used to be our CEO of Boys Prep or as public prep as a whole. And I studied Boys Prep at the beginning. And my favorite subject is ELA because it can help us in real world situations. And my favorite aspect of an all boys school is, you know, we can relate to so many situations growing up in boyhood. And my future plan is to become a special weapons and tactic officer and also invest my company with 3D printing of organs and oil. And to answer that, I would say that um, there's not much to lack as far as, you know, how the um, crime and violence rates goes up in the Bronx or in the city as a whole, because I feel like we could do better with it, and, you know, have less people getting injured or less people in the hospital so that, you know, they could be able to live their lives and, you know, tell stories and for generations to come. And my question for you is, um, what is your favorite part of your current job? Um, ooh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you know, it's been a tough time um, for all of you certainly for Queens, and I'm heading to Elmhurst Hospital when we, we hop off of this line. Um, you know, Elmhurst was the epicenter of the epicenter of the pandemic. You know, I mean, we, I lost friends who worked in that hospital. Um, it was really ground zero where we saw the most, in, you know, one of the highest rate death rates of COVID-19, the highest positivity rates. And um, so I would say right now, the, the best part of the job is being here um, and envision in a, a, a city and a borough where things are done differently. You know, we talk about going back to normal, but a new normal, right? It's like where, where, where I think we can go as a borough. Dreaming of a new normal for your generation, you know, where you don't have to work 40 hours a week just to get by, to, to pay your rent and have no money left over. Um, you know, those are, I think that's the most exciting aspect of the job, seeing the hope. Um, there's a lot of hope that I, that I see in people's eyes here. There's a real opportunity, I think, to reimagine um, how our city moves forward and how Queens moves forward. Um, and I think Queens is certainly going to be one of those places that leads the way out of this pandemic, no offense to the Bronx. Uh, but I, I would say that that's probably, you know, seeing all of you on this line this morning, who could have envisioned that we would all be learning virtually and be able to get on a Zoom, you know, just two years ago. None of us could have fathomed this. The mere fact that you have technology, you know, a lot of you may not have had technology in your household. You know, that's what gives me hope for the future. You, you all being here, me seeing young men this morning on this line who favorite subjects are science and math. I mean, that's what gives me hope when I wake up in the morning. And I have a five-year-old son, so I drop him off every morning. Uh, right before we hopped on, I dropped them off. You know, that's 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 the most enjoyable part of the job. But I think I'm I'm in the driver's seat to shape what your future will look like, and that's the best aspect of this job. Thank you for that. Um, look, number one, we're right on time as far as time is concerned. Um, 
without further ado, we have, uh, we couldn't probably do a lot of what we do without uh, an incredible board. Um, Nicole Green just happens to be one of our esteemed board members on the call. Miss, didn't I see uh, you? Good, 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 good. Um, it just so happens to be that I'm gonna put her out there. Uh, she has a brother who also happens to be a namesake. Uh, I'm assuming she'll tell you a little bit about that, but Miss um, Green, you wanna ask her a question? You're on mute. You're saying something amazing. You're saying something amazing. <laughs> it, it, I have to tell you, compared to all the things that all of the boys have said this morning and that um, uh, that uh, Mr. Richards has said, I, I actually don't think it will sound that amazing. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning and hear from all of the boys uh, from Boys Prep and to see all of you this morning. So um, I have missed being in the classroom this year um, and seeing all of you boys. Um, uh, Dr. Kirkland is right. I'm lucky that my brother, uh, Tommy Kale and Lynn Miranda have a classroom that is named in boys prep. Um, and Mr. Richards, I've loved learning about you and hearing from you this morning. And I just um, was thinking to myself that I think um, not only will you go far, but I think that you have um, certainly captivated my attention. And I think um, I've been more impressed um, by you than any of the mayoral candidates. So um, <laughs> I hope I'm allowed to say that. So um, it has been a pleasure to hear from you this morning and your story um, and your words has been um, incredibly inspiring. And I think all of us have been very lucky to hear from you this morning. Um, and the boys questions have been honestly better than the question I wanted to ask. So I feel a little silly ending on something practical, but I hope that it's a helpful question for the boys. And then I think that one of our other board members will close it out, but I think it's a helpful question for you boys. And a lot of what um, um, Mr. Richards talked about is really important. And when he talked about internships and, and things like that and interviewing, one of the things um, when people like Dr. Kirkland and Ms. Bradshaw and others on this call, um, when we were growing up and we started our jobs, um, things like interviewing and getting inter internships, those things feel really hard and unattainable. And Mr. Richards, I forget the person you were talking about when you had your first interview and you talked about getting your hair cut and putting on your Timberlands and dressing up, but what were the kinds of things going through your head when you prepared for your first interview? How did you practice for that? How did you get ready? Because believe it or not, boys, things like preparing for your first interview or internship are around the corner. And these are important things to begin putting on your resume as you think about college and getting ready for these experiences that will make you different and, and help you get ready um, for whatever your North Star is, whether or not it's college or whatever's next for you. I think that would be a really important thing for Mr. Richards to talk about for a minute because those things feel really far away, but they're not. You'll blink and someone's offering you an opportunity to meet with somebody and talk about yourself for a few minutes and share why you might be different and you deserve that internship or job opportunity to do, to spend a summer doing something for someone. And it might be something that you think you don't deserve or you don't have that experience. And you might have 15 minutes to prove to somebody that you do. And I know it probably feels like a long time ago, Mr. Richards, but when you talked about, it really was inspiring because I remember my first job was working at haagen ice cream. Wow. And um, a long time ago in Alexandria, and I had to take Virginia, three buses to get to my first job. Um, and I remember interviewing for that um, and having to explain why I deserve to work in an ice cream shop um, and having to <laughs> prepare for that interview. Um, and I worked there for three summers. Um, but I remember having to get ready and practice in front of a mirror why I was <laughs> deserved that job because a lot of kids wanted that job that summer. So, Mr. Richards, um, how did you get ready for that? How did you how did you prove to that person that you were the person that deserved that job? And how can our boys today, when that happens, because that could be this summer or next summer or next fall, how can they get ready when it's their turn? Oh, thank you for that question, Ms. Green. And um, as, I, as I said earlier, you know, internships and volunteering, right? So there must have been something that struck um, council member at the time, James Sanders, um, must have struck him about me, right? Because there was somebody in the office, unfortunately, I, I think at that time, I didn't know him who 
was not fulfilling his duties. <laughs> um, so because of this individual was laid, was not, you know, was not participating or doing his job to the fullest extent he can, the his position opened up. It was <laughs> so I would say, um, you know, uh Brother Kirkland spoke of being on time. Like that's important. You have to, you know, you have to master the small before you can be ready for the big stage, right? Um, so you know, so starting off small, you, you can start with, with what you're doing now, showing up to school on time, applying yourself. It does get hard. You're you're like in the seventh and eighth grade. I mean, you're gonna get distracted. But you know, I talked about how I had to learn how to focus, focus myself. So I, I would start with with that. Let me just start with that premise. Um, what I would say is as you look for your next opportunities or for those golden opportunities. First of all, let's start with a parents looking the part. Um, and I, I totally failed in my first interview, but by the time I <laughs> I went into that office, I went shopping. I didn't have a lot of money. Uh, you know, I went to Jamaica Avenue for my first suit. <laughs> it's like this, like the three for like a hundred dollar deal suit deal. <laughs> I remember the guy following me around the store. He's like, you want khakis? And I'm like, oh, I came here for a suit because he just had a he he just thought I the only thing I needed was khakis. And I'm like, no, I'm here because I want to look the part. So um, anyway, I walked out of that store because I felt offended that, you know, he followed me around and it was like the khakis over there. But that's another story. Nothing wrong with khakis, by the way. Um, so, you know, I went went to a different store, didn't have a lot of money, um, did not know how to tie a tie, by the way. My my mother was a good tie. Tie. she could tie my pop's ties um <laughs> subsequently true story i didn't learn how to tie a tie until i became a council member which is a true story um <laughs> so looking the part i would say you dress for the part and you're dressing really for your next job too right you know because each time you're going to elevate to do something else so making sure you always your appearance is very important so let's start there um, when you're interviewing with people, you know, making eye contact, you know, you have to make eye contact. Um, if you have that issue, you practice with folks around you. You got Mr. Kirkland, you're going for that opportunity. You have Ms. Green on, you have your guidance counselors. You know, it's nothing wrong. There are also programs you can go. So you have a library, uh, you know, I, I have the Queens library system, you have the Bronx, but within the Bronx library system somewhere, there is a place that does preparation for interviews. So if you're if you're not confident, even if you need, um, because in all cases, you're not gonna be able to afford a suit or a tie. And I'm not saying you have to go, you know, depending, you're young, you know, people may not expect for you to have a suit, but there are also programs you can find um, that give, if you can't afford a suit or a tie, who can give you a tie? If you need a tie, freaking call my office. You know, I'll figure out a way to get you some of my ties, I'll dry clean it myself. You know, I'll make sure, you know, whatever I have, assuming it can fit you, but don't be afraid to act for help. I talked about that very early, right? Be humble. Don't think, don't feel less of yourself if you don't have access to something. Speak to Mr. Kirkland, speak to Miss Bradshaw and ask them, you know, I need a tie. I don't have one. I need a white shirt. I don't have one. You'll be shocked at how many programs are out there. In Queens, we have a program called 100 Suits. Um, for, and actually he comes out to the Bronx too. So Kevin Livingston does this program to provide dress attire for men who may, or young boys, or you know, focus on men who may not be able to afford it. So let's start there. Um, I also talked about, you know, trying to garner some experience. So volunteering in your school, you know, if you're going for an interview, there may be an opportunity within your school system. You may want, may want Ms. Bradshaw or Mr. Kirkland to write you a recommendation letter. Right, so that's also something important. Your character reference. People will ask you for a character reference on your resume, or even now, you know, if somebody. I just did. I had a, a person who started as an intern who worked for me. She's looking to get into Columbia University for a program. She needed a character and reference letter, you know. Um, so, you know, of course, we did it. And one of the qu key questions, two questions they asked: What were her strengths? What were her weaknesses? So I would say work on your, your, your weaknesses. You have strengths, each one of you have a strength, but also work on those weaknesses 
and be ready to answer that question because I ask people all the time. When people come to interview in here, I have a staff of 73. And if I ask them, you know, what's your strengths? What's your way? I have no weaknesses. We all have weaknesses somewhere. None of us walk on water are perfect. If a person tells me they have no weaknesses, I'm like, huh? Uh, something is not right. <laughs> Everybody has a weakness. So figuring out ways um, to strengthen your weaknesses, um, to, to, to address those weaknesses is, is something key as well. And, uh, and I would say it's okay to be nervous. Um, you know, a lot of people, <laughs> there's no perfect, Barack Obama, remember um, my wife was scared of the public speaking at one point and she's like, I want to be perfect. I don't want to be nervous. And I, I remember telling her like, you know, I read our president's book and one of the paragraphs and one of the chapters, he speaks of how he's still, get, he's one of the best orators of our time, but he still gets nervous when he gives a speech. It's okay to be nervous, but the more you practice, you know, the, the more you ease, you know, your fears. So I would say practice makes perfect. Yes, look at yourself in the mirror. You have friends in your classroom. If you're going for that interview, if, well, I mean, you may have to do it virtually until you go back in some cases, but it's nothing wrong with practicing amongst each other. Find people who are willing to practice with you, a sibling. And I would say doing mock interviews is great um, because you will, you know, will make things better. I'll, I'll quickly also say I did my first state of the borough um, it was uh, it was about a 45 page speech and boy was I nervous I mean I had teleprompters oh boy was it it was nerve-wracking you know I'm reading through the speech at home trying to familiarize myself uh, I made it through the speech <laughs> you know um, but I was even nervous because I've never I've never read off a teleprompter really like that you know um, and then have to present it to the entire borough of Queens you know um, so it's a lot of pressure, but we got through it. So practice, practice, practice. Nothing wrong with making mistakes. Learn from your mistakes so that each time you get better. So that's, that would be the advice I give you. Thank you for that, Mr. Richards. Uh, it's, it's just so happens to be, I'm not going to name the student, but that student now has my tie on right now. Great. Um, so, so he didn't mind taking my tie with me today. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to uh, have uh, closing uh, remarks from uh, our founding board member of Public Prep, the Honorable Boykin Curry. Mr. Curry, you there? Dishonorable sometimes. Um, I really want to thank uh, the, the Borough President Richards. And, you know, I think for the students here, sometimes there are two different views of politics. One is what you learn in civics class, and it's all idealistic, and it's almost this idea that if you just care about the people, you'll be swept into office to do great things. And then you leave school and you start reading in the media or hearing people and suddenly it seems like the whole thing is just a swamp of corruption and money and power and special interests and uh, sort of anything to get power and that's, people get very cynical then. And why the great leaders and why I really admire uh, the, the Borough President Richards is He's not embarrassed, as he said today, that you need ambition and be scrappy and learn how to raise the money and make those calls and figure out how to build coalitions and get out the vote. And that's, you gotta win, right? There's an, and, and, don't, and don't be embarrassed about wanting to win. That's not, mm -hmm. but then once you have the power uh, to not forget about why you did it. It's not all about the power. You gotta get the power to do anything, but then once you have it, there are times when you need to stand up for what you believe, even when it's tough. And your school, there are a lot of powerful groups that would like to shut boys prep, that would not like you to have those options and this opportunity. And if, it, if, if politics was just the corrupt swamp, there would be no public prep. It took a few leaders, people like uh, President Richards who, who knew how to grab the power, knew how to win, but then sometimes are willing to sacrifice a little bit. It would have been a lot easier for him to not be talking with us right now, to never have supported it, to attack charter schools. And, and so those are the real heroes and the people that I think deserve your, not just support, but like the attention. Those are the kinds of people to study as kids, the ones who figured out how to play the game, 
not like night, not just sitting on the sidelines complaining and being too too pure to to get in the to get in the mix. But then once they got there and they got their hands on the levers of power, uh, did the right thing and su and supported, remembered why they were there and to help you like get opportunities that that wouldn't have otherwise existed if it weren't for people um, like Donovan Richards. And so I just want to thank him for what you've done and, and your support, which I isn't always been easy or helpful to your political career, but also uh, for all the kids to, to, to watch people like that and appreciate how hard it is to get where they are, but then also how hard it is and how noble it is for them to sometimes make a sacrifice, take a risk to, to, to bend history. So thank you for that. Thank you. BP Richards, thank you. You said this job helps you learn who your friends are. I hope you know that in the Bronx, you have some friends, um, but in all seriousness, everything that Boykin said, we are so grateful for how you've stood up for charter schools in particular, uh, to make sure that everybody has access to a high quality education. I sit on a lot of fundraising calls and there, I have to say there's something special about your story and why I wanted you to come and share it with our boys today. So I thank you for taking the time to cross the borough um, and uh, inspire our trailblazing seventh graders whose futures are so bright. Um, and we know that because of the village that surrounds them, they're going to do amazing things. And you are now one part of that village. So thank you so much thank you so for much this for morning. Me. Thank you so much for having me. Each one, teach one. God bless you all. Stay safe. Thank you. Follow the social distancing rules, wear your mask, and uh, when it's when you're able, get vaccinated too. Um, but I look forward to seeing y'all in person eventually uh, along your journey. Good luck. Um, there's a lot of hope in this room, a lot of game changers in this room, and uh, you all are going to go on to do great things. I'm more than confident. So stay the course. <laughs>